Henry Washington has over 100 long-term rentals, and he chooses to take a small portion of those and put them into short-term rentals. We're going to learn right now from one of the Bigger Pockets podcast hosts, Henry Washington, on why he does just that. Hey, Team Fearless, I just want to take a quick break from this podcast to talk about funding your furnishings. If you're listening to the Fearless Investor Podcast, then you probably want to do the Airbnb arbitrage model. Reason being, it's a low barrier of entry, right? $10,000, $15,000, $20,000 to buy furniture with someone else's property. And sure, you can use your own bank account or you can raise the money at a low interest rate from a friend or family member. But wouldn't you rather get that money at 0% interest, aka free money? That's what my friends at Pathway Financial can do for you. Pathway Financial helps people like you get 0% interest credit cards so you don't have to have the financial stress of putting down a ton of money up front for your deals. Think about that for a second. How many arbitrage deals could you do if money was not a concern? Well, that could be the exact possibility with Pathway Financial's help. Get a free quote from them today. Go to fearlesskyle.com forward slash pathway financial to find out how much you can get pre-approved for right now. And don't worry, it won't have any impact on your credit score because it's a soft inquiry. So go once again to fearlesskyle.com forward slash pathway financial and get that free quote. Hey, welcome into the Fearless Investor Podcast. You're listening to me, Kyle Stanley. And if you are not already a part of our six-figure formula, what are you waiting for? What if you could have access to our guest, Henry Washington, today, who is one of the biggest deals when it comes to real estate investing, and be able to ask him any question you want. That's exactly what we have in our six-figure formula. In this community on Facebook, you're able to see our live podcast along with extra time on the end where we keep Henry in our room, keep all of our podcast guests in our room, and allow you, one of the members, to be able to ask him any questions. And that's just $49 a month, guys. Like that's crazy. <laughs> access to me, access to the course, access to all of these podcast members, uh, including big top dogs like Henry. Uh, you need to go check it out, fearlesskyle.com forward slash 6FF. Now I'm really excited to have Henry on this podcast. We've become good friends over the last couple of years. He was in a mastermind with me and then he ended up speaking in Fresno, California at a meetup group. And that was really the first time I got to hear his story. And I was like, man, I need all of Team Fearless to hear Henry Washington's story. And that's why we've got him right here on the Fearless Investor Podcast. Uh, one of the interesting things that I didn't even know about until recently was that he had a small uh, portion of his portfolio as short-term rentals. And so when I found that out, I said, dude, we got to talk about on my podcast why you do that. So that's exactly what we talk about here with Henry Washington. Let's get to it right now on the Fearless Investor Podcast. Hey, what's up, guys? Welcome into the Fearless Investor Podcast. We're live here in the Six Figure Formula group. For those of you that are watching on replay a couple weeks later, you missed out, and you'll see why because Henry is a wealth of knowledge. He fills in on the Bigger Pockets podcast for the main one, the real estate one, and he's also uh, the host of the On the Market uh, Real or Bigger Pockets podcast. Henry, uh, also a very good friend of mine. I, I appreciate you coming on, brother. Thank you for having me, man. I'm excited to be here. All right. Awesome. And uh, you said Independence Realty. That's the name of your company, right? That's correct. Independence Realty Group. Over in Arkansas. Now, are you doing all of your deals over there or are you kind of all over the nation? Mostly in Arkansas, Northwest Arkansas, Southwest Missouri. We've got a mobile home park in Mississippi. And that's, yeah, that's about where I'm at. Awesome. Well, I'm going to throw a curveball at you because I, I forgot to prep you for this, but we do have uh, a little bit of an icebreaker here. And with most of our audience being short-term rental investors, yeah. um, I want to know what is your craziest Airbnb story? Now, I know you have your own managers. So <laughs> hopefully they do a good job of like separating you from all those issues. But maybe was there ever a time that you were self-managing mm -hmm. and, and you had some crazy situation happen? No, fortunately, man, I haven't had anything super crazy. Uh, good. I, my manager does do a good job keeping us out of the details of that stuff. I did have, so I had a flood in a, in a, in one of my long-term rentals. Um, okay. And we had to end up housing our tenant in our short-term rental. And, uh, I think her dog ate several parts of my short-term rental. So that was, <laughs> that was <laughs> just oh, no. randomly eating window seals and. Oh my gosh. <laughs> couch corners and door and, then, knobs, but, and yeah. then you kind of said man i'm kind of happy my long term <laughs> yeah. i don't have to renovate yeah. that thing anyway right yeah all right well henry um you are 
uh, as Ron Burgundy would say, kind of a big deal. Um, <laughs> and, and especially in, uh, you know, just overall real estate investing. So I'm excited about today's conversation, not just from uh, a, a perspective of short term rentals, but, um, you know, just what you're doing in the market and what you're uh all the projects you have going on. And, and, you know, as soon as we got on here before we pressed the record button, we started talking about how you have more projects going on than ever with flip. So I'm, I'm excited to just have an, kind of have an overall conversation about real estate today, but I would <laughs> like everyone to know where you came from and what led to your journey of getting into real estate, because I've heard it live. I've seen <laughs> you make just rooms, cry and <laughs> i don't want to i don't necessarily want my audience to cry today but i want them to feel you know what you've been through so if yeah. you can just bring us back to what life was like for henry before real estate yeah man uh i, I spent my life doing the things that you know they would say you're supposed to do you know my father was a my father and mother were big proponents of higher education and so like i always knew i was going to go to college i did that got good grades got a technical degree so I could get a good high paying job right out of college. I did that was designing software for, for Walmart. And, uh, you know, as a single person, I made a great salary. I was making six figures, but, um, if I made six figures, I spent six figures plus some. So, sure, sure. um, I just didn't have any savings, no wealth, nothing to really show for all the work I was putting in. And that wasn't because, you know, the cost of living was just crazy. It was just cause I didn't have any financial education. Um, and, you, you know, you know, one thing I don't talk about a lot is, you, you know, you hear a lot of rags to riches stories, like people who come from sure. nothing and then they they build something and then build wealth. I think there's a, I think there's this gap because there's also people who come from like middle class backgrounds. And when you have like a middle class upbringing, you don't really want for anything like you have what you need. You're not like rich or wealthy, but you don't really want you have the things that you need. And so, like, I remember once I got my own job, like, I tried to live life as if I was my parents who could afford more things than I could, right? Mm. And so I tried to get things before I truly had put in the work to earn them. So I had a nicer apartment than maybe I should have uh, coming out of school. Living I had above a, your means. Uh, yeah, I had a nicer car than I should have, right? Mm. Um, and so uh, those things cost me. And then, uh, and when I didn't have the money for it, I would put it on credit, and then that destroyed my credit. And then I got married uh, pretty quickly. I met my wife and then we married a year later, uh, literally 365 days later. And, you know, you make that physical transition pretty quick, but from a financial standpoint, I didn't, I didn't transition. And so I need, I need to tell you really quick, my wife yeah. and I married exactly 365 days later too. Yeah. Yeah. It's been a good, it's been good so far. So you did, yeah. you did a good thing. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, um, so yeah, you make that quick transition, but like, you know, all the stuff that comes with your life needs to transition as well. And it just, it didn't, it didn't quite move over. And so, uh, I started getting some wake up calls because the lifestyle that I lived as a single male financially just wasn't going to cut it as a married man. So, yeah. you know, I was, I was, I was totally okay with and accustomed to getting paid. And then I would blow most of my paycheck and then have to like do math and figure out, you know, how many ramen noodles and dollar menu items could I eat and still make it to my next paycheck? And like, as Going a single college, dude, yeah, yes, like <laughs> single dude, that's fine. But like my wife quickly let me know that that was not an acceptable way <laughs> for her to live. And so, you know, I had to make some adjustments, um, but also big wake up calls. We tried to buy a house together because that's what young married couples do. Sure. And the bank called me and told me, they essentially said to me, if you want your wife to be able to buy a house, you, you can't be on the loan. Your credit is too bad. You're not bringing enough to the table. They said, we'll consider your income so that you can financially, uh, you know, get this house. But you like I wouldn't able to to be on the loan. And mm -hmm. so uh, that was a big punch in the gut, man. Sure. Uh, you know, because I, I like I said, I did all the things like I did. I checked all the boxes I was supposed to check. I was supposed to be living the American dream. And I couldn't even be on the loan for my first house. Um, and I couldn't be this provider. Like I had a, you know, I wanted to be this husband provider and like, I don't know, that was just a big ego shot to know that like, I couldn't even help provide that even yeah. though my income was being considered. 
Um, but that was the, that was really the first time like I had to step back and think, all right, there's there's something I'm missing here. I, there's got to be some something I need to do differently. The second wake up call came after we had a conversation, you know, the young married couple conversation. You know, how many kids are we going to have? Where are we going to live? What's our dream house look like? Where are we going to go on cool vacations? Right. Every every couple has this conversation at some degree at some point. And it's supposed to be fun. You're dreaming together about your future. And I think she was having fun, but I was terrified. For what reason? Well, because she's she wants to know what you know. We're, we're talking about a dream house, and I couldn't be on the loan for the house that we're in. Like this, yeah. this was my dream house. <laughs> like I couldn't, I didn't know how to provide that, and and I started to panic because I was like, at some point she's going to start doing the math and looking at the numbers, and you know, carrying the one, and the math isn't mathing, and <laughs> she's going to go somewhere else to find somebody who can give her the life she deserves. And I freaked out, man. I, I literally freaked out. I had a full fledged real panic attack in the middle of the night three in the morning just sweating breathing hard like tunnel vision and uh i i just did any i did what anybody would do when you panic like that about money in the middle of the night is i just started googling like how can i make some extra money and that was the first time that i really paid attention to like a lot of these financial terms that you hear all the time, like passive income, like financial freedom, like, you know, equity and, and like, and so I just started to dig into all of these terms and, and it all kept leading me to articles and books and stories about real estate investing. And I was seeing that like regular people owned real estate. This, this, like before that, I just assumed like super rich people did or c corporations. I didn't think like, you know, Joe next door owned a bunch of real estate assets. Like I never had, I never thought about it. Yeah. And so when I, I started to realize, well, I ended up watching this Ted talk from this, from this young guy who was like 20 something years old and he was financially free. And the whole point of the Ted talk was talking about, look, you don't need to be a multi bajillionaire to be financially free. You just need enough passive income to cover your life's expenses. So do a budget, figure out what your life's expenses are, and then find a way to generate enough passive income to cover those expenses. And then you can choose to work or not. And like that thought process of it had never crossed my mind before. I was like, you're, you're right. I don't have to be this multimillionaire. I'm like, there's a path to financial freedom. And it seems that I can get there through this real estate thing. And so I decided in that moment that I was going to figure out how to be a successful real estate investor. Mind you, Kyle, I had none of the things that would allow one to be comfortable with that decision. I had no money. I had a thousand dollars in my savings account. That's all I had. I had uh, bad credit still, <laughs> right? That's what I had the panic attack about. I still couldn't, my credit wasn't fixed. I didn't know how to buy a house. Like I had none of the knowledge or things that one would say, yes, I, I can go buy real estate assets. And so, but I, I just knew that I could figure it out. I just, I just was like, if all these people have figured it out, I got to be able to do it. I decided I felt comfortable with that decision. I woke up in the morning and told my wife that we were going to be real estate investors. And she was honestly thrilled with that decision. Really? Yeah. Well, wow. if, if you think about it, my financial plan thus far was spend all my money and eat ramen noodles. So when I came to her with something that was actually going to build wealth, she was like, yeah, this is better. We should do that. We should do that. Right. So did, did she have a, a clearer, you know, cause like, yeah. just like what you said, when you think about investors and real estate investors, like yeah. having bajillions of dollars to throw at real estate, did she know that you didn't have to? Did she already have some no. of that background? No, she didn't. She obviously yeah. had questions, but uh, you know, she she had faith in me when I didn't have faith in myself to mm. to go figure this stuff out. Okay. Um, and so we started our journey like researching together because neither of us had those answers. And so we read Rich Dad Poor Dad together. We read Richest Man in Babylon together. We read The Millionaire Real Estate Investor together. Um, and so we were learning the same lessons at the same time, um, which helped us understand kind of how we were going to move forward. Um, I started going to every real estate meetup I could go to. I started telling everybody that I was a real estate investor. I had no idea how to be a real estate investor, but I, this, I just am a firm believer in this world gives you what you put out, right? And so if you want the things real estate investors get, 
you need to tell, act, be a real estate investor. You need to put out the things that real estate investors are, and then you'll get those returns. Now, also, like, no, who, like if I didn't believe I was going to be an investor, who else was supposed to believe me? So I just told people that I was a that I was a real estate investor and that I was buying property, even though I had no idea how to do it. And that's actually how I got my first deal. I, I just, just from telling people that I was an investor, a good friend of mine actually came to me at work one day and said, hey, bud, I heard you're buying houses. And I was like, yep. And he, sure am. Yeah, that's, that's right. And he said, look, man, I got to sell my house and I need to sell it in the next 30 days or I'm in trouble. Wow. I, I got to go buy a piece of property um, from a guy at my church for us to use for the church. And I have to sell this property to be able to have the loan and afford to do that. He said, so I'll sell my house to you. I just need to sell it for 115 or 116,000, something like that. And that'll give me enough money to go buy this piece of property. The house is probably worth 165, 170 grand. So oh, wow. like, I know I'm selling it at a discount. I don't care. I just need this much money to go do this, buy this other piece of land for my church. He was like, so like, and I knew where his house was. I'd been there many times. So he was like, can you buy it? And I was like, yeah, <laughs> yeah, I can buy it. 100% I can buy it. I had no idea how to buy it. I literally, yeah, I so, so we were, we were at work because we worked in the same building and he was like, all right, so what do we do? And I was like, be right back. And I ran to my desk. <laughs> and I You're like, I was going to ask you that. Yeah, right. Right. I literally Googled like how to buy a house without a realtor. And then it was like, you need to, you know, put it under contract. And I was like, cool, what's under contract? Right. I'm like typing all this <laughs> into Google and it's like, you need a purchase and sale agreement. And I'm like, cool, where do I get a purchase and sale agreement? And yeah. then like I downloaded one off the internet and then like changed the names to mine and his. And we signed this contract that says I'm going to buy his house and close on it in 30 days uh, for $115,000. And, and then I was like, all right, we're under contract. <laughs> And then I freaked out because I was like, I don't have, I still only had a thousand dollars in my savings account. I was like, I don't know where I'm going to get the money, but I know banks have money. And so I'll just go to a bank. And so the, the way I, the way I did my analysis of which bank to go to was I just went to the one that was closest to my office and I walked Damn. in, I walked in the door, literally with the contract in my hand. Like I walked in and I asked the, the people, I was like, can, uh, can I talk to somebody about buying this house? Like, I, I, need, <laughs> to, I, need, to, I need to buy this very house right here. And, <laughs> and uh, uh, the, the person that connected me with, the loan officer, he looked at it and he goes, you know, this house is probably worth a lot more than this, right? And I was like, yeah, I mean, I, I do. That's why I want to buy it. He makes it sound like that's a bad <laughs> yeah, thing. Right, right. And he was like, How'd you, how did you get that? And I was like, well, you know, I'm a real estate investor. <laughs> yeah. What do you mean? <laughs> what do you mean? <laughs> and so he was like, yeah, man, we'd love to finance this deal. Mind you, he had never ran my credit or anything. He just knew it was a great how deal. Great. And so how great is that, that, yeah. And so uh, he was like, you're going to have to bring a 15% down payment, right? So you're going to need about 20 grand. Do you have 20 grand? And I was like, oh, yeah. Yeah, 100%. <laughs> In I my to. mattress. Let me go get right. it. Yeah. yeah. I, and so, you know, problem one solved. I had a bank who was going to loan on it. Problem two, problem, new problem is I need 20 grand. And so um, part of what I also did after the panic attack and the decision to invest is I just started going to every real estate meetup I could, like literally like relentlessly consistently every meeting if there were people in a room talking about real estate i went to that meeting no matter what i was in there and i started to build these relationships with these investors and so um when i had this deal under contract and i needed 20 grand i just went to those investor friends and i was like how the heck are y'all getting the money to buy these deals because there were people in there doing a bunch of deals and so one investor sat down and brainstormed with me about different ways to get access to money in 30 days and uh, eventually the conversation led to like, you know, you can borrow against your 401k. And I was like, well, what's that mean? I don't want to, I don't want to withdraw. And he was like, no, 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 you can borrow. And if you borrow, then you don't have to pay the penalties or fees. It's your money. You can borrow up to a certain percentage of it. And then the company will take your payments out of your paycheck and it actually reduces your taxable income. So that'll help you from a tax perspective. And if you rent that property out, Technically, the cash flow from the rental pays back the loan you used to buy it. There and I was go. like, well, this sounds like a fantastic idea. I just need to go find a 401k now because I didn't have one of those either. And so that's when I went back to my wife and I said, hey, remember when you said we were going to be investors and you were like, yeah, let's do it. Well, uh, we, we need to borrow 
20 grand from your 401k so that <laughs> we can buy this house and be real estate investors. And she said, yes, without hesitation. We had the money wow. in two weeks. We bought the house. We raised the rents. The cash flow covered the expenses on the house, the 401k loan, plus put some money in our pocket every month. And then the bank that I used called me and asked me to take out a line of credit on that equity in the house so that I could have access to funds to go bring them more deals like that because it was such a good deal. It was a low risk investment for them. They wanted right. me to keep bringing them similar deals. And so I went from panic attack to 90 days later, I owned this asset and then had access to twenty twenty five thousand dollars on a line of credit. It's like not just, to mention all the equity that you had just that, yeah. got it yeah. from the uh, the it added crazy, uh, value yeah. there. That's crazy. I, there, there's so much good stuff and we haven't even gotten to short term yeah. rentals yet. And this is part of why I wanted to have this conversation is because um, if you just put your your name out there as a real estate investor, right? Yeah, like man. people a lot of people get into this industry thinking like, I got to have everything figured out. Oh, I got to go have the I's dotted, the T's crossed. I got to have my website up. I got to have my business cards ready. I got my LLC set. And, and I got, I got to pick my, my lane. And, and if you mm -hmm. do, if you just go out there and start talking to people and say, I'm a real estate investor, you'll be shocked with how many yeah. opportunities you have come your way. And you said it yourself, when you put it out in the universe, it comes back. I promise you, Henry, it's crazy how that's happened in my life. When we were at right around 35 properties for short-term rentals, I was like, you know what I'd really like? I'd like to start having some with pools. Like, I think pools would do really well. And in the next two weeks, I got three leads with pools. And those were the yeah. first leads I ever had with pools. I'm like, how did that happen? And yeah. when I first got into real estate investing, I was like, yeah, I'm going to go and buy a house. And and literally, like, I started having leads just come my way because I was just telling people the same thing that you were. And so uh, I guess speak to that really quick, like, yeah. especially because you have a mentorship program and you get people, I'm sure that get analysis paralysis. <laughs> yeah. How, how do you just get someone over that hump of like, I need to have all I's dotted T's crossed, yeah. everything ready to go and just get into action like you did. Yeah, man. Well, it starts with your why I had a pretty strong why, you know, oh, yeah. I, I knew, I knew I needed to create a better life for my wife. Your why is what keeps you going when things get difficult. Your why is what keeps you looking for answers. But it, it, the, the truth is the decision that I made to become a real estate investor, that was the most powerful thing that I did because I decided at three in the morning, even though I didn't have any other things that common sense would tell you that you need to be a real estate investor, I still made a decision. Like I made that decision in my mind. I made that decision in my heart. I made that decision in my soul. Like I just knew I was going to figure this out. And I don't think enough people make decisions when they want to do something. I think people try stuff. Yeah, I was going to say. Trying stuff doesn't get you there. Dip your toe in the water. Right. Trying. And, and when you think about a decision, right, a decision is just a it's a it's a it's a mindset hack. Right. It's a way to trick your brain to help you. And when you think about what decision does, decision means like there's no other option. It's decide like suicide means to kill off. Like the, the suffix of the word decide is side. And so if you put that to work, it means we're doing this thing and there's no other thing. So if you make a decision to be a successful real estate investor, now as I start to go down the lane of becoming a real estate investor and I run into roadblocks, my brain automatically is trying to help me figure out how to get around those roadblocks because the thing I told it we were going to do hasn't been done yet. When mm. you say you're going to try, you do, you try. And when you run into a roadblock, it's easier to quit because your brain shuts down. It doesn't help you try to figure out how to navigate because you didn't tell it that's what you were trying to, you were going to do. You, you said, we're going to try this and your brain's like, cool, we tried it. I did it. So, I so what's it. next, right? And yeah. And so the decision was a huge impact. And once I made that decision, um, the next thing people should do or think about is, is, is we learn what's possible by seeing who around us is doing that thing, right? Um, and I think if you aren't surrounded by people who are doing the thing you want to do, so if you've got a bunch of people who, who want to own and operate an STR business, but their circle of influence uh, people don't own any SDRs, well, then it, it, they're going to have slower progress. Mm. But if you're surrounded by people who are successful at what you're doing, both virtually and in person, then you will be the next person doing those things. You know, we interviewed a guy once who bought a 
over a hundred units apartment complex for his first deal ever. And when we asked him why he started with a hundred unit multifamily property as his first deal, he said, I, I didn't know I wasn't supposed to all of my friends own apartment buildings. So that's, that's, that's just what I did. Right. <laughs> and most investors feel like you have to work your way up to that. And he's just, that's how he walked in the door because that's what wow. he knew was possible. And so surround yourself with people who are successful if and that will help you figure out the how, like, cause it, and the how is so different for everybody. Like, yes, there's some general steps we should all follow, but like how you get there can be so different because everybody's financial situation is different. Everybody's buy box is different. Everybody's market is different. Like how you get there may not be how I get there, but the decision you make to be successful should be the same. And that, that, and then you just have to solve the problem in front of you. You don't have to solve the 10 problems ahead of you. That just, those, those, those will come and they may change. You may not know what that problem is because you may go about it a different route. I didn't expect to be here talking to you and to be on bigger pockets. That wasn't part of my path. Mm. So had I laid out all these steps to follow, it would have sent me down a path that didn't lead to where I am now. So yeah. I just solved the problem in front of me. I love that. And it's so organic, right? Just allowing nature to take its path. Yeah. Um, and we talk about that a lot in SCRs and just solving problems in your market. Maybe arbitrage is going to be the solution that people want because in that market, yeah. people just are looking for guaranteed rent. And then in another market, it might be creative financing. In another market, it might be flipping. It might not even be short-term rentals, right? right. Um, and I, I got to read this comment priscilla says you just put it out there and shit happens so that's, that's, that's <laughs> I like facts it. though that's I like facts. It, Priscilla. Yeah. all right uh my next question for you has to do with that decision that you made and yep. your wife being just so on board do you ever think about what you would have done if she wasn't on board or are you ever just man. like man i am so stinking happy that i didn't have to convince my wife to do yeah. <laughs> Yeah. Uh, you know what? I haven't thought about what would have happened if she didn't, if she didn't agree, you know, I'm probably wouldn't have been the end of the conversation. You know, typically when people say no, it's, You're it's, a good it's, 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 well, it's, it's, <laughs> out of, it's out of lack of information, right? Like it's typically up to the person who knows more information to educate the person who doesn't have all the information on why something is a good or a bad idea. And then you should both be open to listening to people's objections, objections. And then you, you, you pick what makes the most sense for you. Um, fortunately enough, she was on board, um, for the investing as a whole, but I did have to do con some convincing when I talked her into selling our house that we had bought together so that we could go house hack a duplex. That took some, that took some convincing, but we, we did that and we house hacked a duplex and that was probably one of the best moves we ever made. That's cool. Yeah. Uh, you talk a lot about networking, um, you know, just getting mm -hmm. in all the rooms for the meetups, surrounding yourself with those people. Mm -hmm. Tell me if you were to put an importance of on, on a scale, mm -hmm. one being the least important, 10 being the most important, how important is, especially when you're getting started, mm -hmm. just getting in the same rooms as people uh, that either are where you want to be or maybe potential clients of yours? Yeah, it's a 12 on a scale of one yeah. to 10. Yeah, you got to do it, man. It's, it's, you, if, if investing is local. And so, you're going to need local people, businesses, contacts to help support you um, in your endeavor. If you need financing, well, banks are typically at these meetings, like lenders who are interested in lending. If you need contractors, they go to these meetings. If you need title companies, there's somebody in these meetings or there's somebody using these services. It's how you're going to get connected to the things that are going to help you be successful. It's how you're going to build relationships. Real estate's a Real estate's not a real estate business. It's a people business that transacts in real estate. And so the more people you build relationships with, um, the better off you're going to be. I, I've done, I've made tons of money just because of the relationships I've built in these meetups, right? I've got a business that that same guy who gave me the advice about using the 401k loan ended up being a business partner. We own about 25 doors together, right? So we built a, you know, multi-million dollar portfolio together. Uh, because I went to meetups. Um, I've got, I've borrowed private money from people in meetups that have funded deals that have made me, you know, hundreds of thousands of dollars. Like the, there's so much money in the meetup. Uh, don't worry about the speaker or what they're speaking on. Like the content is so not important. It's the nice. people that are in the room that are important. But I think the, the catch is 
you have to be consistently going. You can't just show up every once in a blue moon and build the relationships. You have to make an effort to be consistent in showing up no matter what they're talking about. So I want to pause for a second and team fearless. I'm talking to you right now, just because Henry is talking about real estate investing and, and Airbnb, especially when you don't own the property, isn't necessarily real estate investing. It's more so hospitality. Mm -hmm. Uh, it's still the same practices, right? We're still needing to do the things that Henry is talking about, going to meetup groups, getting in front of all of the realtors, the mm -hmm. lenders, the escrow officers, because you never know where your next deal is going to come from. And how easy is it to not have to worry about, man, I'm putting $5,000 into my marketing campaign. I sure hope that I get a return on that. <laughs> right. Instead, you go to and you just put your time into meeting people. And before you know it, you, you realize that your currency for marketing was not money. It was time. And now you have all these leads coming in because of all these relationships that you've built. How much of your deals, not necessarily outside of this with, you know, um, your team or anything like that, but just the deals have come from your networking versus marketing dollars. Yeah, I'd probably say somewhere between 15 to 20 percent of my deals are networking. Yeah. The rest are coming from marketing. We're pretty heavy into marketing. Um, but I mean, yeah, I mean, if I look at the projects we're doing right now, we've got about 12 going on. I know about three of those came from networking. Yeah. And you know what? I should have asked this in the beginning, but can you just give everyone a little bit of a overview of uh, your business? Yeah. What? projects you're doing and also how many properties you have in your portfolio? Yeah, absolutely. We own about a hundred and about 107 rental properties. Four, four of those are short terms um, and the rest are long terms. And then we also flip houses. So we flip, well, up until this year, we were flipping between 10 and 15 houses a year, but this year we'll probably do closer to 30. Wow. What's been the change reason for the change? Hired a team, got a project manager. Can do more now. I love that. We talk about team all the time. You know, I put about three to five hours a week into my short term rental business because my team is so solid. Uh, what does a team allow you to do? I don't need to hear that you're you've got a bunch of time freedom. I just want to know what does that allow you and your business to be able to do? Yeah, it, it, it allows us to scale and then allows me to be more strategic. So with my time, I now can focus more on the things a that I either want to focus on or B that are more strategic for a business or C that are going to bring in more money. And so having somebody in the role of like a project manager allows me to focus on bringing in more deals, which I now get to do. And then we can actually buy those deals and, and actually monetize those deals because somebody else is managing them. So it kind of, you kind of get the two for one there. Right. Yeah. So I, I can make, I can bring in more deals and then, and we can produce more by doing more deals. You get to do the needle moving activities, mm -hmm. the money making activities. You told me that you have four of your 107 is short term rentals. Mm -hmm. uh, why add that to your portfolio? Um, you know, I, 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 um, I don't necessarily have a, like, I don't have a niche. Like if I'm forced to say what kind of investor I am, I tell people I'm a buy and hold investor, Okay, but I'm not, I'm a deal finder. Like, I just focus on finding really good deals and then I monetize those deals in the way that makes the most sense for the deal and for my financial situation. And so the reason that the properties I have um, as STRs are STRs is because that's what makes the most sense for that deal. They're in excellent locations that I know people are going to pay a premium uh, to stay in those areas from a short term perspective. And and so it's the it's the strategy that makes the most sense for those properties because of where they're located and the value and equity that's in them. Um, one of them was a long one of them was a long term rental. It was, it's a duplex. It's, it's a long term rental and it did great as a long term rental. And I said, this is just too good of a location. Let's try it out and see as a short term and worst case scenarios, we'll flip it back to a long term and it's been rocking and rolling as a short term. And then I've got two other properties that are both. Uh, within a mile radius of that property. And so we're making those short terms because we have proof of concept with the one that's close to there. But I, I do feel like there is uh, a growing opportunity in the short term slash midterm space because of the lack of affordable housing and the lack of uh, mm. supply in the rental industry. 
just with inflation and, you know, people who make 15 to 17, 18 dollars an hour, it's difficult for them to find a, a whole apartment to rent, nonetheless, a house or a duplex. And so I think renting by the room or doing some type of midterm uh, rental situation, I think the opportunities are growing in that space as well. So we may be converting more as we as we go forward. OK, I can't wait to catch up with you in six months and see how many yeah. you've got. Yeah. Uh, besides location, what other things are you looking at to say this? This to me makes the most sense as a short term rental. Do you have anyone or do you have any part of your brain that has the space to be able to go in and say, like, OK, let me analyze this deal. Or do you have someone on your team that's going and analyzing yeah. that? So so my strategy is a little different from somebody who may be just like a, a short term rental purist as a strategy. Okay. So my strategy is always I'm going to find a good deal and I'm going to buy a good deal. And then I'm going to figure out how to monetize that deal afterwards. And so I'm, I've never said differently. I've only bought one. I've bought, I've only, of all the deals that I buy, I've only bought one deal that the plan was to make it a short term rental. Like f for me, I underwrite everything that I'm going to keep as a long-term rental. It has to work as a long-term. Awesome. If it doesn't work as a long-term, I don't buy it. And then I'll buy it and then I'll tr I'll do the short-term and then the added money is icing on the cake. But um, I, I am not in a market like, you know, um, like the Smoky Mountains or right. like some of these places that are, are have been doing short-term rentals since before Airbnb was a thing, right? Their economies are built around tourism and short-term rentals. And so the likelihood of rules changing and, and, and things like that, that are going to affect you are, are less, like I don't live in a market like that. And so I wouldn't buy anything in my market solely based on Airbnb or short-term rental, just because things are like, the, even the sub markets within my market have different rules for short-term rentals and how to get into them. And yeah. so I just play it safe. I underwrite them as long-term rentals. And then if they're in a great location or, or they have the amenities that I think would 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 make sense, then I'll do it as a short term rental and get the bonus cash flow. But I can always pivot back. And therein lies the reason why most people fail when the economy shifts in real estate, right? <laughs> if you can only make money with it as a flip and then everything drops, yep. you're screwed. If you can sure. only make money with it as a short term rental and then the market gets saturated, you're screwed. And this is where a lot of people I think have, you know, started crying Airbnb bust yeah. and, and oh my gosh. And you know, the, the worst one that I hate, and I'm very vocal about this. I hate that people are like, oh yeah, Airbnbs have uh, really hurt the affordable housing uh, market. <laughs> Anywhere you look, man, it's like Airbnbs are like at most 1% of the yeah. available homes in the area. And so I just, um, I just think what you said is so important for me. I look, it has to have three exit strategies, long-term, short-term, mm -hmm. and potentially a flip, uh, or at least added equity in the next two to three years that will right. allow me to be able to sell it at a, at a profit. Um, is it just two, two for you? Do you have a certain number of, yeah. of exit strategies that you need per T deal? Typically I want more than one. So if it's yeah. two long-term, long-term and flip, typically go hand in hand in my market. Like if I can buy it at a point where it's going to long-term cash flow, it'll also be able to sell it at a profit. So I'll get those two hand in hand. And if I get those two, then, you know, there's typically a three with short term. It just depends. There's some neighborhoods where short term probably wouldn't work around here, but for the yeah. most part, long-term and flip are, are, are the two main exit strategies and, and they, they kind of go hand in hand. Tell me what, what your average earnings are on one of your long-term deals uh, per month versus mm -hmm. your short term. Yeah, man. So if you look at my short term, I'll just I'll just tell you tell you the numbers. I think we paid 175 for it a couple of years ago. I think my mortgage payments like I don't know, eight, nine hundred bucks, something like that. Nothing. Uh, yeah. And as a short term rental, we were getting twelve hundred per side. So um, you know, twenty four hundred uh total. And as a long-term rental, I think we get somewhere around 2000 per side on average, sometimes more, sometimes less. So it's not a ton more, but, um, 
the, the months when it's good, it's really good. So uh, I, I think you switched up there. You said as a long-term rental, you're getting 2000 per side. Did you mean as a short-term rental? Sorry. Yeah. As a short term, okay. Okay. as a short term, we're getting, so we range anywhere between four to six grand a month on that thing. Um, there you go. Versus 2400. Uh, versus 2400. And then um, uh, my, my long terms. So like my long terms are, I'm pretty conservative on cash flow numbers, so I underwrite everything pretty drastically, pretty heavily on the expenses side. Okay. Um, just because I know that it's probably not going to pan out like that, but if it does, I'm still good. And so I do thirty percent for expenses on top of oh, debt wow. service. So you know you've got your mortgage taxes and insurance, and then I do another thirty percent on top of that. Um, 10% for vacancy. I'm sorry, 10% for capital expenses, 10% for property management, five for vacancy, five for, uh, for, uh, normal, just maintenance. Sure. And so if after all of those expenses, I'm cash flowing on a single family, I want to cash flow, uh, at a minimum net 200 as a, as a, uh, multifamily, I want a hundred to 200 a door. Um, and those aren't, you know, when you think about it, they're not like, you know, mind blowing numbers, but for me, I'm not living off my cash flow. For me, mm -hmm. it's, I'm building a portfolio. I'm reinvesting the money in my business. My cash flow from my rentals isn't going into my, you know, personal pocket. Yeah. Um, it, wealth isn't built through cash flow. Like people want cash flow because cash flow can get you out of your job quicker, right? Like that's the yeah. draw, but that's not where wealth is built. Wealth is built through debt pay down and equity and appreciation. Uh, so that's what we're looking for. Absolutely. And I'm assuming most of your paying yourself comes from your flips. Yeah. Either from the flips or from, uh, you know, education. There you go. I like it. Um, I want to end with a question, bringing us back to your whole original reason that you got into real estate. You said that you had that mindset shift when you heard that 20 year old talk yeah. about how, if you earn more than what you spend, uh, especially in passive income, that's financial freedom. Yeah. Do you still define financial freedom as that or have you leveled up? From yeah. I mean, that's level one financial freedom, right? Yeah. That's the ability to be financially free. What the reality was once I was, once I hit that point, I didn't leave my job. Like, <laughs> I, I, I stayed with my job. Like I would, we got to that point almost, I mean, within a couple of years mm -hmm. I could have, I could have quit my day job and lived off the cash flow from the rentals, but then that would have stopped the progression and the growth would have slowed us down tremendously uh, as far as building a portfolio goes. And I would have had to change my lifestyle. Yeah. And, and so I kept my job until I kept my job until it cost me money to keep my job. Like until I was losing money by having it. And that's when I decided I need to leave my job. Uh, but yeah, man, no, for me, just, just getting enough to cover your expenses is level one financial freedom. It gives you choice, right? Cause now you can go get a different job. Maybe you can go get a job that pays you a little less money, gives you a little more time. So you can focus on building your business some more. Mm -hmm. um, it gives you choice. You don't have to do something you hate anymore. You can go find a job you like more. Um, to bring you income and then continue to grow your business. But I wouldn't recommend anybody just quit after level one financial freedom. You'll be, you'll have your expenses covered, but you, you're not going to be rolling in it. So how would you define it today now, given where you're at? When you, when you think about your current situation, how mm -hmm. do you define financial freedom for, for you in your situation? Yeah, the, the, the freedom for me um, is... Uh, having the comfortability to live the lifestyle that I want and still grow and scale my business. Mm -hmm. So being, being able to be financially free and not have a job, but not sacrifice growth in my business, not sacrifice lifestyle and be able to do the things that freedom provides. Um, and so like I, I, I have a great business and I have a team, but I also, if I don't want to work tomorrow, Kyle, I won't work and no one's going to die and we'll still make money. And, uh, and so I can be where I need to be and do what I want to do, which allows me to be a better husband, a better father. Um, for me, the freedom, financial freedom is, is never about us. It's about 
who we get to impact because we're financially free, who we get to help because we're financially free. Um, and so I, I would say uh, when you're thinking about your financial freedom, don't think of financial freedom as a goal. It's not a goal. It, with real estate, it's an inevitability, right? If you invest long enough, at some point you'll become financially free. So start thinking about what are you going to do with that freedom? Yeah. Whose life do you get to impact because you're financially free? What does that really look like? When you start to think and dream like that, then you really start manifesting some cool stuff. I love it, man. All right. Well, you, as everyone has seen, you're a wealth of knowledge and you're teaching a lot of people how to be able to download your brain and put it into theirs and, and start doing the things that you're doing. Um, can you let people know a little bit more about what it looks like working with you and your mentorship program and uh, what the next step is, especially for uh, yeah. being fearless here on what they need to do to, to get into your inbox? Yeah, man, my, my, my mentorship is cool. We're trying to help people build uh, build and grow a real estate portfolio. And we're not exit strategy focused, right? So we're not a, you know, buy and hold, you know, mentorship or a STR mentorship. I tell people, we're going to teach you how to solve the two problems that all real estate investors face. Those two problems are deal flow and money flow. Mm -hmm. If you had a flow of deals for properties that you could buy at a discount and you had money to buy those deals that wasn't money out of your personal bank account, everybody would buy property at their own pace and comfort level. Like we would just grow because we, we, we have the deals and the money. Yeah. And so my mentorship program focuses on teaching you how to become a great deal finder and then how to go find the money to fund those deals. That isn't money out of your bank account so that you can grow your, at your own pace. And then you can exit out of those deals the way you want to. We've got people in my program who are, doing short-term rentals. We got people who are flicks and flipping. We got people who are doing a combination of all that stuff. So for us, we're going to teach you how to go find good deals. We're going to teach you how to solve those problems. I, I put a lot of my time into the community. I'll meet with everybody twice a week. Um, plus I have, uh, you get one-on-one -on -one coaching through another one of my uh, coaches in the program. So we try to give a ton of help in the program. So if you're interested in, in that, you can, you can um, have your folks go to my Instagram, the Henry Washington and send me a DM with the word fearless Kyle and we will uh, we'll get you scheduled on an interview and we'll, we'll call you. We'll talk to you about it and we'll get you, we'll get you a discount. Awesome. Thanks brother. Um, so again, guys, the Henry Washington on Instagram, DM him fearless Kyle. He'll get you those next steps. Uh, Henry, is there anything that you want to leave everyone with before we log off today? Yeah. Um, two things. Uh, if you're feeling overwhelmed with real estate, uh, doesn't matter the strategy. Uh, there's a common denominator in real estate. And the common denominator in real estate is it doesn't matter what exit strategy you use, short terms, flips, rentals, long terms, mid terms, wholesale. The one thing you need for any of those strategies to work is you need a good deal. And so if you're feeling overwhelmed, like I don't know what my next step is, I don't know what to do next, put the blinders on and focus on learning what good deals look like in your market and then focus on one strategy that you can relentlessly, consistently implement until you find that good deal. Once you find that good deal, you'll be able to monetize it because if it's truly a good deal, call me, call Kyle, we'll buy it, right? Call another investor in your market. A good deal is easy to sell, right? Um, or you'll be so motivated to go figure out all those next steps on how to buy that deal uh, because you have a good one on the hook. And so stop worrying about everything else that's not important. Uh, don't worry about, you know, anything else that's not important. Just go find yourself a good deal. And then remember, folks, that we're in real estate. It's a people business. Typically, you're dealing with people's houses and homes that you're buying. So just take care of people. Be of service to people. Sometimes you can help people without having to buy their house. Just figure out how to help somebody. If you figure out how to help the person across from you, I promise you deals will come. Money comes. Take care of people first. Henry Washington, you're the man. I appreciate you jumping on here to help our audience conquer the world of, yeah, short-term rentals, but also just real estate in general. Thanks so much, man. Thank you, bud. I had a great time. All right, guys. We're going to keep it right here for the Six Figure Formula questions. If you're not a part of the six figure formula and you're listening to this on replay, make sure to go ahead and join at fearlesskyle.com forward slash six FF. But for now we're going to say adios and we're going to have all of our questions answered in the six figure formula community. We'll see you next time.
So once again, if you want to get connected with Henry, all you have to do is go to his Instagram page. If you're listening on the podcast or watching on YouTube, it's down below in the show notes and or description. You can click on that link. It'll take you right to his Instagram, uh, but it's just the Henry Washington and you DM him with Fearless Kyle and he will get you more information on how to be a part of his program. That's going to do it today for the Fearless Investor Podcast, where we're helping you to conquer the world of short-term rentals. We'll <laughs>